All right, praise the Lord. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Living Water live stream Bible study. Uh, Living Water is an outreach of Soterios Ministries Incorporated. <clears throat> my name is Bernardine Wormley Daniels and it's my pleasure to be here with you on tonight um, relaying the Word of God. It's a beautiful day today. So wherever you are, whether you're in your car or sitting in the park or at home in your favorite chair, um, share the link, uh, share the notes. They're the same notes from last week. And um, let's uh, get into the Word of the Lord. Um, we're going to be Picking up where we left off on last week, we started a um, teaching on intimacy with the Holy Spirit and how um, the Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom of God on the earth. He is our beloved friend, um, a refuge for us in a time of trouble and ultimately the bondage breaker when we get into difficulty or challenges. I actually am reading a um, book. Um, I don't really have a um, thumbs up or thumbs down on it because I haven't finished reading it, but the title caught my eye um, so I've been watching this young man on YouTube and uh, checking him out um, um, on deliverance. He says a couple of things that, I mean, I agree with like maybe 98% of what he says, but that 2% uh, regarding um, deliverance for believers, um, we kind of differ just a little bit. Um, he doesn't think that a Christian can have a demon living in them because the Holy Spirit lives in us, I would disagree. I think that you can have a demon living in you. And um, whether you're a believer or not a believer, um, the Holy Spirit lives in our spirit. So I'm in that camp. Holy Spirit lives in our spirit. He would agree on that. Um, but he says that the oppression is external. And I think the oppression can be from an inter internal dwelling of an unclean spirit in your body or in your soul, um, not your spirit if you're born again. But this is his new book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker by David Diga Hernandez. And um, he talks about how you can get free and stay free. Do you have trouble breaking sinful habits or suffer from mental and emotional struggles? Do you desire to get free and stay free from the enemy's cycle of bondage? David Hernandez has more than 20 years ministry experience dedicated to the Holy Spirit, prayer, and spiritual warfare. Um, he has seen thousands permanently set free from the enemy's crippling attacks. Um, he's an evangelist, best-selling author, teaches us how to break the demonic strongholds of bondage over your life. Um, so there's some interesting um, things in it. Um, so um, I'm gonna be reading it and I'll, I'll come back and let you know whether I give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. But um, it looks very interesting. He does make some very, 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 very accurate points. There are a couple of uh, as a, in the body of Christ, there are a couple of camps um, as it relates to deliverance. Um, all Christian, well, not all, because some are cessationists, but Christian ministries that do deliverance would agree that it is possible for a believer to need deliverance. Where they disagree is on whether it is a, a demonic oppression that is a result of spiritual warfare externally, or the other camp would say it is from a demonic oppression that is um, from internally from the things that we have opened the door to and allowed the enemy to 
live and take up residence in our soul. I'm not so sure that the two different perspectives are not saying the same thing in a different way um, because they talk about strongholds. I just think the stronghold can be internal. That I mean, I've ministered to people and seen um, believers and seen demons manifest so I don't know how, how you excuse that, how you say that's not coming from within. But anyway, if you are a bibliophile like me and you're interested in reading and studying, and this, is, this will be an interesting one. So we'll see what we think about that. All right, grab your notes and um, let's jump in. Uh, jump in the comment section and say hello. Let me know that you're out there. Um, we're going to pray and welcome the Holy Spirit and get back into the study. So grab your Bible. The notes were on my page last week. It's the same notes. We didn't finish. So if you want to go onto my Facebook page, scroll down and you'll see the notes posted there. Okay. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We welcome you tonight. We love you. We trust you. We need you. We surrender all to you. So we invite you to come, Holy Spirit, and be with us. Enliven our Bible study. Break seals of revelation off the word that there might be a shifting in our perspective so that it will radically align with yours. We desire truth in the inward parts and so we can't have that without you because you are the spirit of truth. So I ask you to rest upon me, think through my thoughts and speak through my words and have your way tonight. And we will be ever mindful to give you alone, precious Jesus, Holy Spirit. We give you all of the glory, all of the honor and all of the praise Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. We bless your holy name. We love you, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so I've got like several translations lined up here just in case we want to jump around <laughs> and uh, look at things from a different perspective. We'll see. Okay, so um, let's see. No comments. Comments from the audience will show here. You guys are not, let me, um, okay, there we go. Let's see who's in the room. Good evening to Kathy. Good evening, Catherine. Uh, good evening to my cousin Mary and my aunt Mary. Praise God. Good evening, Faith. Um, good evening, Gwendolyn and Loretta. Good evening, Chu. Um, good evening, May. Um, hello there, Sabrina. Good evening, uh, Jill. Um, Jill James. Good evening, Renee. I was up in your parts, not too far. I, ha I was up in um, the Port Huron area, actually up in t um, 25 at Lake Huron because their um, God's Treasures um, camp. It's a, a camp that they do in June and July each year at Lake Huron Retreat Center, which is a beautiful retreat center right off of um, Lake Huron. Beautiful place to go for a retreat. And they do a, a camp for adults with special needs. So my daughter is there for camp. She was excited beyond just excite, excitement. I mean, she, she was happy to get away from her mama and her mother's happy for her to get away, <laughs> praise God. So she's up there where the weather is great and the water is beautiful. Um, good evening, Eva, praise God. All right. so. Let's look at our notes. We have been studying intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Um, the, 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 the teaching that I did on last week is, um, it might still be on my Facebook page, but it is definitely on my YouTube 
channel. So you can go to YouTube, just put in my name, go to my channel, subscribe, 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 click likes on the videos. The more you subscribe and click likes, they go up, you know, the chain, more people get to see them. Okay. So we started um, last week and I talked about um, just, you know, uh, desiring um, for <clears throat> a deeper revelation concerning um, what it means to really walk um, in the Lord's footsteps and what it means to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And um, so we looked at that. <clears throat> we looked at how the Holy Spirit came and the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming <clears throat> was to keep us in um, right relationship with Jesus Christ, to keep us aligned, you know, to, to bring healing and deliverance and salvation to our soul. So we looked at um, some passages of scripture where the Bible, like John 14, tells us that the Holy Spirit would be our helper, that he is the spirit of truth. That actually is David Hernandez's point in the Holy Spirit being the bondage breaker. Uh, he essentially is saying bondage is a result of a lie. When the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth comes in, the lie is broken and deliverance comes, praise God. Um, and so we looked at all of that um, and then we talked about... Um, I shared with you hot off the griddle. I talked about how I was with um, my dad and my brother-in-law at the um, skill uh, center where my sister is undergoing some wound care. And um, there was just conflict in the atmosphere. <laughs> you know, she was being herself. And uh, anyway, it was just kind of rattling me. So I stepped out of the room was leaning against the wall in the corridor and I heard the Holy Spirit say, do not back away from the darkness, you carry light. Um, infuse the darkness with the light. So we took a look at that. That word infuse means to fill, to permeate. So wherever we are as believers in Christ, we carry the Holy Spirit with us. We carry light. The scripture, matter of fact, says we are light. And we looked at several passages of scripture that tell us indeed that is the case. Um, um, fill, permeate, imbue, impart, introduce, saturate um, the places where you are, pour the light that is in you into the atmosphere around you. And sometimes, you know, we don't do that. Oh, a lot of times we get caught up in the atmosphere and we allow it to affect us as opposed to us infusing um, the darkness with the light that we carry. And so we then talked about how Holy Spirit was poured out um, to help us in abiding, in abiding in him and he in us. And we looked at John 15, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So we looked at all of that. We need to abide in Christ and he in us that we bear fruit. Um, that uh, John 15 verse 7, he, he says to us, if we abide in him and his words in us, then we ask whatever we wish and it will be done. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And he tells us to abide in his love. So we looked at that word in the Greek. That word is meno. It means to stay to stay in a given place, that place is in Christ. So stay in him, remain, do not depart, do not pass go, do not collect $200, stay in Christ, okay? Stay in your seat. Tell your neighbor, stay in your seat. Bless the Lord, okay? Um, all right, so we talked about how abiding is intimacy and how there is um, a difference. Oh, what is this saying? Good evening. Oh, um, she's saying she'll be there Friday. 
Um, okay, I got distracted by the, the, the strength. Okay, so abiding is intimacy. We talked about how there's a difference between intimacy and um, just holding hands. You know, some people like to have a superficial relationship with Christ, um, but you cannot conceive, you cannot bear fruit. Fruit is the, is the byproduct of conception and conception is the result of intimacy. And so we said that, that um, you cannot um, um, just like hold his hand and think that that's not, people don't get pregnant just holding hands. Holding hands is a start but there's deeper, there's more. And so you can't hide a pregnancy. When we have been hanging out with the Lord, when we have been abiding in him, we begin to walk in the overflow. And we, we establish that the problem in the church is that people want the power, they want the glory, but they don't want to go through the process. They, they prefer artificial insemination. They don't want genuine intimacy. They want artificial insemination because they think that's quick. There's no, there, there's no need for vulnerability or surrender. See, real intimacy requires vulnerability. It requires surrender, um, bearing your heart before the Lord, saying yes to him, worshiping him, um, 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 establishing a rule of life that involves prayer and just sitting with him. You know, my spiritual director um, in this, um, during these weeks told me, Bernadine, find time to just sit with the Lord. Just, just be with him, okay? And so this is where we left off, where it says in your notes, again, Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost so that we would be, it's the Hebrew word, echad, echad, echad. It means one, one with God through Christ. That's how we're adopting it. Echad is one or a unity. And we want to be echad, one with God through Christ, children of light. Holy Spirit keeps the post-Pentecost church, that's us, seated with Christ in the heavenly places, abiding in him and he in us. And so why? Why is that? So that just as it is in heaven, it will be on earth. So that the as we release the light that we carry, it infuses the atmosphere and, and heaven, the atmosphere of heaven overtakes the atmosphere of earth. Okay, so that so Holy Spirit in us, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places so that we can infuse the darkness with the light of truth. And you and I, we have to learn how to be more stealth, you know, stealth, undercover. Like when, when you're shopping or, you know, in the park or, you know, on your job, just your presence usually will aggravate demons. If you're carrying the light and if you have the light on, you don't even have to be saying anything. The enemy just will become aggravate, aggravated, but others will be drawn to the light. They may not even know why, but it, you'll know that it is the light of Christ in you that they are being drawn to. And so um, uh, John 3 and um, 16, which is a passage that we know so well, that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, the, the um, um, cosmos. He, he, he loved his creation um, and did not want us to perish. That word perish in the Greek means to be excluded from the messianic kingdom. He doesn't want us to be excluded from his kingdom because outside his kingdom, there is no life. See, um, Luke 19 and verse 10 says, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And so in prayer, um, in recent months, I heard the Holy Spirit say, say this, 
the Holy Spirit just whispered this in my spirit. He said, salvation is shifting one's focus. It's, it's a shifting of your sight from the things of the world back to God, back to right relationship with God. The psalmist in Psalm 121 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. So we shift our focus from the things of the world back to God and back to right relationship with God. And we begin to focus on him. And that's what brings about that salvation, the, the um, renewing of the mind, the, the restoration of the soul, us being born from above or begotten of God. The post-Pentecost spirit baptized church or the believer who abides in Christ, who gets in that that, that love seat with him in heavenly places by faith, the one who does that, we begin to carry the power and the glory of heaven and we are empowered to reach into the darkness and pull a lost soul into the now where faith transforms the heart and where God abides. And so as we, as we abide in him, we carry that power. And the more we stay in our seat and the more we exercise our faith in releasing that power and glory, the stronger our spiritual muscles become, okay? So salvation is, a, is, is flipping a switch and turning the light on for sight and intimate knowing. And then we minister that salvation from our seated position in Christ, bringing other lost souls into the dimension where he is and he is the I am, okay? So salvation is when, you know, we say yes to God. We say yes to his word. We flip the switch on. We turn on the light. We are washed in the water of the word. Our spirit is born again and light begins to shine in us, illuminating any dark places in our soul that may need cleansing. So we wash that in the truth of the word of God and that darkness is expelled, okay? So we minister um, salvation to others or we share salvation with others, beckoning them to come in from our seated position, bringing lost souls in. So how do we do that? Well, love ultimately prevails. And let me say this, um, I've been um, worshiping at uh, Connection Church in Canton and the pastor was doing a series, um, just finished a series of messages on uh, modern love or what, what love really is. And he made this statement, which I thought was very interesting, where he said, the world didn't invent love, so the world doesn't get to define love, okay? If you want to know what love is, you go to the Word of God. The, the Word of God defines for us what real love is. And real love, according to the biblical um, um, definition. God is love. John in his epistle said, God is love and love prevails and love covers a multitude of sins. First Peter four and verse eight, first Peter four and verse eight. Flip there in your Bible. Peter lives uh, back there by Hebrews and, and um, James. You'll, if you find Hebrews and James, you'll find Peter. First Peter 4 and verse 8, Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. That word cover is the Greek word kalupto. It means to cover up to hide, to feel, aren't you glad that the love of God through Christ, kalupto, it covered your sins with the blood of Jesus Christ when you confessed and repented, his love covered you, see? 
Love heals wounds. Love heals fears. Love restores the soul. And I'm not talking about some crazy, you know, ooh baby, ooh baby, you know, um, eros type love. I'm talking about agape covenant love, the God kind of love, the love that is God, the love that is God heals, um, restores the soul. So when, when we love the loss, then we learn to speak the truth in love. And um, that doesn't mean that we alter the word of God to a accommodate or appease people's flesh. That's not what it means to speak the truth in love. I want I, I want us to look at the word in from a place. So as a location, in is a location. If I um if I take this this bottle and I say there is water in the bottle, okay, that means it's not falling all over the place. It is in the bottle. And so <laughs> So when we say speak the truth in love, that means that we get in our seat with him in heavenly places. So we're seated in a place of, and we speak the truth from that place of love. Okay. That was worth you tuning in tonight right there. So we speak the truth in from through that place of love and he is that place of love so we get in our seat abiding in him abiding in his light and from there we speak the truth and if we're speaking the truth it'll sound like him because he is truth remember holy spirit is the spirit of truth and and then john also tells us your word thy word is truth Okay, um, the word of God is truth. So I think, and, and I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm stuck right there because we have made speaking the truth in love mean what it doesn't mean. We, we think that that means that I say things in a way that it doesn't hurt your feelings. I would rather hurt your feelings and save your soul than to try to uh, uh, alter the word of God to accommodate sin. No, we, we speak the truth in from a place of love. I get in him, in the Holy Spirit, in Christ, in my seat. And from there, I speak truth. And when I do that, it should sound like the word of God. Okay. So the problem is, this is something that the Holy Spirit showed me. He said, the problem is what the church does is the church stands outside the kingdom and yells at the world and that doesn't work. We have to have the heart of the father, the heart of God loves while one is yet in sin. Listen, that, that right there, the only way you can do that is by doing it in love, okay, in as a place. The only way you can, well, maybe let me speak for me. The only way that I can do that, particularly with people that I don't even like, let alone love in the natural, is from a seated position in him, allowing his heart to work through me. Are you, are you guys with me? Um, okay. Um, so... 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that while, that's not, um, that's not 1 Peter. I think that's, wait, wait, wait. I think that's in Romans. Is that the passage I just read? 1 Peter 4. No, that's not um, for now. That's I think that's Romans. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the heart of God speaks from within the warm, convicting, transformative confines of love. And you know what? Here's, here's how you know whether it's coming from that place in him, that place of love in him, or whether it's coming from your flesh. Because when you speak the truth in love, 
It can be a strong word, but it will produce conviction, not condemnation. When you feel condemned and like somebody slimed you, that's not the spirit of Christ. Christ can speak in a way that is very convicting, but it will draw you to your knees in repentance. And, and that's the difference. So the heart of God speaks from within the warm, convicting, transformative confines of love. And, and that, that's the only place he can speak from because God is love. So to reach the harvest clothed in Pentecost Holy Ghost power, the church, that's you and I, we must revisit um, God's love. We must learn what agape covenant love is. We have to get back in our seats and sit with him and just be with him, um, pray, talk to him, get to know him because discipleship, remember, is when we begin to walk, talk, act, do just like our rabbi. People bump into us and they have encountered Christ because we're so much like him. And so that means that we got some sitting to do in your seat, get in your seat and stay there. The Lord said, I am love and love becomes the lens through which everything else flows, okay? So if we attempt, you and I, if we attempt to lead or we attempt to serve or we attempt to witness outside of love, I, and, and when I use the word love, I'm talking about God who is love. So when we attempt to lead, serve, or witness outside of that place of love in him, which is intimacy with the Holy Spirit, then it becomes legalism and it becomes oppressive and it dims the light, see? And people usually can tell, people know the difference. It becomes legalism, it becomes oppressive, and it dims the light. Jesus says, I am love. And so the church today needs a course on what love looks like from his perspective, okay? And then we need to get, uh, sit in that, abide in it, live in it. A course on Holy Spirit intimacy and passion for Christ because everything flows from there, okay? So disciples, you and I, um, the Lord says, are known as my disciples by their love. So that's in John 13 and verse 35. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so that love must be cultivated in the seas, in a secret place. Listen, we do all kinds of crazy things in the church and we blame it on the Holy Spirit. Oh, and we want to make it seem like it's Holy Spirit motivated. But if it isn't clothed in the love of God, then it, it's not Holy Spirit motivated. Even like I said, even if it's corrective, it will flow from that place of love that brings conviction and repentance and not legalism and, and um, condemnation. That's not the spirit of Christ. So love has to be cultivated in a secret place, in the bridal chamber, that place of worship, that place of soaking prayer, that place of feeding on the word of God, that place of discipleship, that place of sitting at his feet, of beholding his feet, face, seeing him as we walk through the word, abiding with him, hearing him, then doing what he says to do. See, um, matter of fact, um, uh, Bishop Bill Hammond from Christian International, Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, he says, this is the definition of success. You want to write this down. This is the definition of success. Success is hearing the voice of the Lord and doing what he says to do. It doesn't, see, if we hear him and then we don't do it, that's not success. Success is hearing what he says 
and then doing what he says to do. So if you're, if you're related to me, you may be thinking, well, I don't know how I'm supposed to do all that. I don't even like whoever so-and-so. You can fill in the blank. I don't even like so-and-so. How can I love them? And I'm telling you, it takes the Holy Spirit. I have ministered to people all over, all over the world, people that you know, people that you know that I knew, people that I didn't know, people that I don't have any feelings for one way or the other. And there are times where you can feel the compassion of the Lord flowing through you for that other person and just a deep love. And I know it's the Holy Spirit because I'm like, I don't even know you. I have no reason to like you. I have no reason in the natural, okay, to love them. So it, it, is, it is the Spirit of Christ that does the work in us. And so the Lord, in that time, in that moment when he was just quickening these things to my heart, and he said this to me, get back in your love seat with me. Get back in your love seat with me and lean into my embrace. Turn light back on and, and, and um, begin to, you know, um, look at the individual from there. So in other words, when you get up and you go running around in the kingdom, uh, running around in the shadow lands <laughs> and you, you left your seat, it's hard to love people for real when you're running around out there. So he said, get back in your love seat with me where you are seated with me in heavenly places. Get back in your seat and look at the person from there. See them from my perspective. I'm telling you, we have got to learn how to do that. We have to learn how to do that learn how to see from his perspective and it'll change the way that you see. Um, I, I remember when I was a seminary student years ago in my 20s, praise the Lord, and um, I took a class, I think it was my last year um, in seminary, I took a class that was had to do with like the theology of, of um, art or something like that. You know, like making art like a spiritual experience, something interesting. I'll have to find my old transcript and see what the name of that class was. But I remember our textbook was called um, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. And um, the, our professor had guaranteed us that at the end of the semester, we would be able to complete our final project, which was to look in a mirror and draw a self-portrait. And I was thinking, get out of here. There's no way I'm gonna be able to do that. And um, so the first day she had us draw a portrait of herself. And of course, mine was like a stick figure with you know, hair or whatever, because that was that, that was all I had. So she began to teach us techniques that helped you to see through the eyes of an artist, like using the visual capacity of an artist. You can teach, you. some people do it naturally, but you can teach anybody how to do that. And I'm telling you, we did, we did pro projects where like a three-dimensional, one of them were looking down from a seated position, looking down at my foot. I had to draw that like that part of my leg down at and, and draw the foot so that when you looked at the picture, it looked like you were drawing, looking down and, and, and I was able to do it. It was incredible. But here's my point that when she began to teach us how to see artistically, you look at people differently. You look at people differently. I remember this guy, I won't, I won't say his name, um, that was a student at the school. And he, he wasn't the guy where you would call your girlfriend and say, girl, he is so fine. No, he, this, he wasn't that guy. Okay. <laughs> he wasn't that guy. And until, you know, like I took this class <clears throat> and our assignment was to draw eyes. We had to draw eyes. So you're walking around campus and, look, and I remember looking at him completely different. And I remember thinking he has the most beautiful eyes that I had never noticed before, 
ever had noticed. But when I looked at him through the, through the, through the lens of an artist, I saw him differently. So now put that in a spiritual context. How would we see each other? How would we engage each other? Even the people that we think we don't even like, how would we engage them if we begin to look at them from a seated position through the Lord's perspective? See, because if you change your location, you'll change your perspective. If I'm walking around, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Years ago, um, when I was appointed to plant a new church, and that was an experience that you just cannot begin to imagine the stress, but they had bought this collection of abandoned storefronts. I don't know whose bright idea that was and was refurbishing them. And they were hiring, um, they were cheap labor trying to save money. And so um, they were doing stuff wrong. So what was supposed to take like maybe three, four months of refurbishing this building on East Seven Mile took three years, three years. I was appointed in 97. We didn't move into the building until 2000, okay? Three years, it was crazy because they were doing stupid stuff. Well, one of the things that they did was they hired some architect, I don't know who this person was. I kept telling them, listen, I have a cousin who's an architect who has done some designs for different churches in Detroit. My cousin, um, his name his name was Guy, but we called him Douglas. Guy Douglas Rose, my cousin, was an architect. And I said, I have a cousin who's an architect. No, that would have been too much like right. They hired some crazy person who drew the blueprints from um, a bird's eye view as if you were looking down on the room, okay? So when the contractors who weren't professional contract, just Joe Blow from under the viaduct somewhere, came in and looked at the blueprints, they put stuff up from a bird's eye perspective. So like the drywall, they only put it up so far and they left these gaps between the drywall and the, and the roof and the see any so what the architect didn't do was he didn't draw it from a three-dimensional perspective as if you were walking through the rooms he should have done both perspectives but he didn't so when the people came to doing the construction they looked at the wrong perspective and hanging the wall and nothing was passing inspection it was a nightmare, okay? I'm telling you, a nightmare. They were hanging doors backwards, you know, and I'm thinking, listen, shouldn't the lock be on the inside so that if I'm a thief and I walk up to the church, I shouldn't just be able to unlock it and come in? Even I had enough sense to know the door was hung backwards. It was crazy. So imagine if we change our perspective, we see things differently beloved, okay? So the Lord is saying, we have to learn to see from his perspective. And that's what activates the love. So we spend time communing with him, sitting at his table. The, the, the communion meal is a covenant meal and it is a picture of the love of God for the harvest his body broken, his blood shed. Why? For the harvest, because of his love for his, for um, humanity. So who is the Holy Spirit? How does the Holy Spirit connect into all of this? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is not an it, he's not a force. He's not really a ghost. <clears throat> no, the Holy Spirit is not a feeling that we get Although when the Holy Spirit begins to manifest, it does affect our feelings and you can very, you can definitely sense and feel his presence. No, the Holy Spirit <coughs> is a divine person of the Godhead that we can and we should get to know intimately. Holy Spirit is God and is co-equal with the Father and the Son, God the Father, 
God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's no competition in the Godhead. There's no competitive jealousy in the Godhead. So God the Father is not upset about you wanting to get to know and be intimate with the Holy Spirit because God, one God, one God, Echad, one God, okay, expressed in three divine persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God. There's no competition. The scripture tells us that Jesus came out of the bosom of the Father. This is in John's gospel. And he is the exegesis. He is the um, he's the interpretation of the father. That's why he would say, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the father because I and my father are one. Well, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of Christ. If you, if you develop an intimacy with Holy spirit, you're developing an intimacy with Christ and intimacy with the father. There's no competition. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He reveals the Son. The Son reveals and is the express image of the Father. One God expressed in three persons because one times one times one is still one. So Holy Spirit is the heart of God and the love of God. And so there's all kinds of scriptural evidence for Holy Spirit as God. We, we can look at a couple of them. You just go to the beginning and you'll see the Godhead in the beginning. In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. That's, that word is Elohim. It is a plural word that expresses the triune nature of the Godhead, okay? Um, in the beginning, Elohim. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together right there created the heavens and the earth. As a matter of fact, I did a whole class, I think six, seven week class um, called um, uh, Hebrew language treasure hunting and unpack that in the Hebrew. It is fascinating, fascinating. You will see the entire God here. Matter of fact, the first verse in Genesis is a is a declaration of the cross you'll find the sun everything but we don't have time to go into all of that so the earth was formless and void darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of god was moving over the surface of the waters there you go and elohim said okay again that's the godhead if you go down to verse 16 you'll see god made two lights um um, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Uh, 116, that's, that's not 16, it should be 26. I think that's a typo. Genesis 126, yeah. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That is the Godhead, okay? Um, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having a conversation we're going to make Ha'adam, the humanity, male and female in our image. And you'll see that in verse 27, then God created the Ha'adam, humanity, in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. There's humanity, male and female. Um, he created them. Then God blessed them. God bless them. You should circle them. Not God bless the man and the woman was an afterthought. No, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply because the man cannot be fruitful and multiply without the woman. Okay. Fill the earth and subdue it. So God gives them um, dominion over the earth, them, male and female. So we see scriptural evidence that um, um, the Holy Spirit um, is, is a part of the Godhead. And you'll see it over and over. There are several passages of scripture there. Um, let's see, the scriptures demonstrate that the Father is God. John 1.1 1, 1 shows that the Son is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, Acts chapter 5 tells us that the Holy Spirit is God. That Acts chapter 5, that is the passage of Scripture, um, I believe, where you have Ananias and Sapphira who decide they're going to deceive 
um, the early church, they sold some property and they agreed on a price to tell the church that they had actually got for it when they were holding back money for themselves, which really wasn't the issue because the land belonged to them. They could have said, well, we sold it. We're going to donate this much and we're going to keep this much, but that's not what they did. They were deceptive. And so um, in that passage of scripture in Acts chapter five, Peter says in verse three, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? Okay, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And so look at it. Why has Satan filled your heart? Um, to lie to the Holy Spirit, you have not lied to men, but to God. So it's a reference that the, the New Testament church saw the Holy Spirit as God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. So let's take it deeper again and look at the role of the Holy Spirit. So if, because if we don't know how the Holy Spirit operates then it is difficult for us to know um, how to be intimate with the Holy Spirit, okay? So there are several rules, I mean, not rules, but clues as to the role of the Holy Spirit in the earth realm, okay? In the kingdom of God. Um, and so Jesus has this conversation with his disciples in John 14, John chapter 14, and beginning at verse 15, okay? Um, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. So these are all clues in the text. Helper with us forever spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you <clears throat> okay so he's speaking of after pentecost where the holy spirit comes and lives within us because of what happened through the cross so he says i will not leave you as orphans but I will come to you. So how is he coming to us? Well, his spirit, he sent his spirit. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one, okay? So after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but will see, you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. So Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you're going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? So Jesus answered him and said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And the Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me <clears throat> does not keep my words. See, this isn't even hard, see? This is how you know who loves God and who doesn't. <laughs> if they live in like the world, they don't love God. Okay, it's simple. He says, this is how you will know. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while abiding with you. And here again, a clue as to who the Holy Spirit is. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace. I leave with you my peace. I give you not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. So the Holy Spirit is our helper, another helper, our parakletos in the, in the Greek. 
That mean, that word means the Holy Spirit is our intercessor. Man, when we have a need, the Holy Spirit is our intercessor. He goes in between the opposition, the issue, and us. He goes before God on our behalf. He's our intercessor. He's our consoler. That means he soothes, he calms, he relieves, he supports, he cheers up, he raises our spirits. He's our advocate. That means that he, he works as an activist on our behalf. He sponsors us. He promotes us. He backs us with the dreams and visions that God has put in our heart. See, he, he believes in us. He's in favor. He's our campaign manager. Okay, <laughs> that, that, all of that is caught up in that word parakletos. He's our comforter. So he's our intercessor. He's our consoler. He's our advocate. He's our comforter. That means that he provides well-being, secure. And why is it that we go everywhere else instead of to him? When What we need is in him. When we have an issue, we should go to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit, to the Lord. The scripture that passes we just read said he's with us forever. He's with us. The Greek word meta, that means he accompanies us. He, he occupies an, um, an immediate position between with or out. He's with us, meta. He, he's all around us forever, aeon, without end, when we're in Christ. He is the spirit of truth, the breath, the divine life of truth, okay? And the world cannot receive him because it doesn't see him. You And to see him, there, there has to be some repentance. Repentance is like the windshield wiper. When you're living in sin, you got mud all over, mud, dirt, you know, fog, just all across your, your, your windshield, and you can't see. But when you repent, confess and repent, it cleanses your, oh, then you can feoreo, which is discern, see, experience, see, intensively acknowledge, see, perceive, okay? So the world doesn't receive him because it, it, they, they don't see or know, but we know. That's the Greek word, ginosko. That means that we're sure, we understand because our windshield wiper works <laughs> and it's removed the, the debris of the world. So you know, because he abides with you and will be in your, he is in us now because we're after the cross. So he abides, he continues, he endures. God knows he has endured because we have done some colossally stupid things since we first came to know Christ, at least I have, okay? And so the Holy Spirit um, endures. Aren't you glad that he didn't abandon you and forsake you when you snatched your hand out of his and jumped out of your seat when running through the shadow lands? Okay. The word says, I will not leave you orphans. He won't leave us parentless. You're not parentless. You're not fatherless, regardless of what the enemy has been whispering to you. You are not fatherless. Holy Spirit is with you. Okay. Um, he will, he said, we will come to you. That means that he, he accompanies us. Sometimes he will actually appear in different ways. He'll make himself known. Um, how does he come to us? The Lord comes to us in the person of Holy Spirit. And so what happens when he comes? Well, in John 14 verses 15 through 27, that passage that we just read, what happens when he comes? Well, life happens. We shall live. See, when the Holy Spirit comes, we live. Life comes. He keeps us. That's the word terreo. It means he guards us. He holds us fast. He preserves us. He watches over us. The Holy Spirit will disclose. <clears throat> it means that he will manifest. He will um, disclose by words. He'll show us things. He'll help us to understand things. See, we become his abode, his residence. The Holy Spirit lives in us. 
we become the naos, the house, the, the temple of God. And then he teaches us didasco. He causes us to learn. He causes, he breaks the seals off the word and causes us to understand things that maybe we didn't understand before. You just have to ask him, Holy Spirit, help me, show me. I, I do it all the time. When, when the Lord speaks something to me, I'll say, show that to me, show it to me in, your, in, in the word. Lord, <clears throat> Holy Spirit, help me to understand. <clears throat> and he will teach me. Be why? Because that's who he is. That's what he does. He'll bring things to your remembrance. Um, that's a Greek word, which means he will quietly remind you. You know, he'll just kind of, you know, tap a, you know, press a, a button on a file in your soul and cause it to float to the surface. You'll go, oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, that's the Holy Spirit. He'll bring things to your remembrance. He, he'll suggest things into your memory. He'll put things in your mind, see? And of course, he brings peace. That's the Greek word, eirene. It means to set at one again. I love that definition. In other words, it means that like something was out of alignment, but peace causes everything to come back into alignment so that it becomes one again. Like if it's fragmented, pulled apart, peace is when it comes back together again. To set at one again. You, listen, we should begin to decree that over some things, over the places in our life where there's fragmentation. Just lay hands on it and say, peace in the name of Jesus. I, I decree peace. I speak peace. I say, be set at one again. That word also means quietness or prosperity. See, um, this erene is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word shalom, which is a powerful, powerful, powerful word in the Hebrew. Nothing missing, nothing misaligned, um, um, peace, uh, wholeness. Okay, that's a rain, eh? to be set at one again. How many of you want peace with God? See, I want peace with God. I want my heart to be set at one again with him. I want peace in me. I want peace in my spirit, in my soul, in my physical body to be set at one again. Peace you know, uh, over relationships, over my home, peace, be still, see? Um, so you have to ask him for that. And then, um, uh, oh, wait one second. Okay. And then um, he tells us to let not our hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. So that means that there's we have a, a role in it um, what's interesting, that word let is the word tarasso, and it means to stir, to agitate, or to trouble. So let me go back to the verse. Essentially, it says, do not trouble your heart or, or do not, that, that word let and that word troubled is the same word in the, in the Greek. So do not trouble your heart or you'll be troubled, essentially. <laughs> you know, so... How do you not trouble your heart? You keep your mind stayed on Jesus and you will not trouble your heart, okay? And it won't be afraid. So the Holy Spirit is the bondage breaker. And that's something that we really need to grab a hold of on tonight. David Diga Hernandez in his um, new book that I was telling you about talks about how we can experience permanent deliverance from mental and emotional and demonic strongholds. So look real quick at 2 Corinthians 10 and verses 4 and 5. Now, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5. All right. This is the um, New American Standard Bible that I have, okay? Okay. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations 
and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Look, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for what? For the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised against the knowledge of God. Let's, let's read that. Let me get a simpler translation. And let's read it. I think this is the NIV. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. Let's look at it. This is the NIV. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have um, divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish strongholds. We demolish strongholds, arguments, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. In other words, any thought, anything that goes through your mind that doesn't align with this book, you, you, you grab it and hold it captive. You grab it and hold it captive. You do not let it take up residence in your temple, okay? You are, ah, uh, no, you're not getting it. You can't come in, okay? So let's look at this. Let's, let's look at how Holy Spirit works to be the bondage breaker. Um, so the scripture says that um, for the weapons of our warfare, that word for weapon is hoplon. It means any tool any implement um, for preparing a thing. It's the arms used in, in warfare. So the enemy has got all kinds of tools or weapons that he will use, but the, our weapons, our tools, what we prepare, see, for our warfare, for um, sh um, strategia, which is military service. So people like to think that when you come into Christ and you're in the kingdom, that you are like just, um, you know, sitting on the pew, just, you just doing, that's just your part. No, there is no demilitarized zone in the kingdom. When you are in the kingdom, you are in kingdom service. That means that you are a part of um, the, the Lord's army, the army of the Lord, okay? And you have a rank and you have a role. And so our weapons are the for the weapons, the tools, the implements, the arms for our military service are not of the flesh, the sarkikos, sarkikos, um, or sarks, I think is the is the root. Th that means they're not carnal. They're not governed by human nature, but by the spirit. So we cannot defeat the enemy with flesh. When when we get in the flesh, we fall right over into his camp and he's going to whip your behind. So our tools, our arms, the, 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 the weapons that we use for our warfare, for our military service in the kingdom are not governed by the flesh, not governed by the human nature, okay? Um, it, that won't work, all right? But they are divinely powerful. That means theos dunatos. That means they have God power. <laughs> Listen, that means that our weapon, theos God, dunatos power, divine power. Our weapons have God power, you know, divine power, If as long as we're in the spirit, because they're his weapons, see, that he gives us. His power working through us. Okay, let's look at this. Let's see how this works. Divine power for the pulling down of strongholds. One, one translation says, the New American Standard says, the destruction of fortresses. Another translation, the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds, fortresses, same thing, okay? So to destroy, that's the word kapharesis. It means the demolition the destruction, and I just had a picture that came in my mind of one of those big trucks with the with the crane, 
you know, with the long arm, the crane, and it releases that crane and just demolishes a building, can like take out a house with like one blow. That That's the kind of power that we're wielding. That's the kind of weapon, weaponry that we have access to if we stay in our seat and we use our supernatural weapons. Remember, not the flesh. You cursing somebody out, that ain't going to win the battle. <laughs> You slapping somebody, that ain't going to win the battle. That'll get you on the evening news, okay? You acting like, hold my earrings. Let me take off my shoes. You want to get with me? That ain't gonna, that, that's flesh, okay? No, our weapons are have God power for the de demolition, the, de the destruction of strongholds or fortresses. That's the Greek word, oku, um, Okuroma, 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 okay? Um, it means a castle, a fortress, an argument, um, reasonings by which disputes or endeavors to fortify an opinion and defend it against an, an, an opponent. So uh, a, a castle or a fortress or an argument or a reason that fortifies itself as a strong opinion in your soul, okay? A stronghold is an ungodly imagination or mindset or argument that is rising up in you against the truth and the word of God is the truth. It is a deceptive way of reasoning. It is a deceptive thought pattern. Have you ever just listened to some people talking? You're like, what? What did you say? Oh, like, all you have to do is, <laughs> if you ever go on YouTube and watch some of these videos where these people are arguing about the definition of a woman, like what is a woman? And they can't define <laughs> a woman. Come on, that's a stronghold. And you just kind of like, what did you say? You know, th those are strongholds. Those are ungodly imaginations, mindsets that rise up against the truth. Come on, it's not hard. You 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 either got an XX chromosome or an XY chromosome. It, it's it's not hard. You have certain body parts that you were born with. Okay, um, so uh, these thought patterns become safe havens for the works of the flesh and demonic influence and what happens is that that thought pattern begins to influence you and then it produces an ungodly behavior and if you don't correct it it becomes a a place of spiritual bondage which is fed by the thought pattern that is that is of demonic influence that feeds and fuels the ungodly behavior that keeps you in that place of spiritual bondage that is fueled by thought patterns that do not align with the word of god that are that are fed by demonic influence they produce ungodly behavior which produces spiritual bondage you see the cycle you see the cycle and the scripture says that you must destroy them for you see the believer for the believer the well let me go back so we we destroy we we demolish those strongholds okay um for the believer the root of every kind of spiritual stronghold is spiritual bondage is a stronghold of deception okay for the believer the root is going to be a lie that we have that we believe and that we have allowed to build a fortress in our soul i'll say that again for the believer if a believer needs deliverance it is because there is a spiritual bondage that is rooted in deception. There is a lie that we are believing. And if we can identify the lie, which is the root, then we can get the captive free. I'll just let that kind of linger out there. Are you guys out there? Somebody say amen. For the believer, the root of every kind of spiritual bondage is a stronghold of deception. Okay. Um, so deception becomes the root of all defeat. 
and the devil is the father of all deception. Let me see what's going on there. Uh, let me go back. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm trying to fix the stream. It's telling me that it's, um, it's having performance issues. Okay, I hope you can see and hear me. I'm not sure that you can. It's not responding the way that it should be. Okay, if you can see me and hear me, just um, say amen. Put it in the, in the chat. Praise God. Let me know if you can see me and hear me. Put it in the chat. See, I'm not getting a response. I don't know what's going on. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to move forward. Okay. Okay, you can see me. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah, it's doing something weird on my end. Um, it does something in the in the um, system. Doesn't like what I'm saying, probably. All right. It's just the warfare. All right. So strongholds let's say that again for the believer the root of spiritual bondage any area in our life where we are experiencing consistent defeat there is a stronghold that is rooted in a lie okay there's a thought pattern that is influenced demonically through its suggestions whatever and it produces an ungodly behavior that holds us in spiritual bondage. So if we can identify the lie, we will see people set free. So deception becomes the root of all defeat. The lie, the lie that says you're too old, it's too late, um, you can't do it, nobody loves you, um, you know, those types of things, those are lies, okay? Um, you're not good enough. Those that that voice that wants to constantly harass you and remind you of something, <clears throat> maybe that happened years ago that you have confessed and repented. You know, wants you to feel like you're not um, forgiven or that you're not saved. When I used to do the Ask the Pastor um, program at TCT uh, back in the day, and we would get we got calls all the time. Um, from people who thought they had committed, um, for instance, the unpardonable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or they they were convinced that um, um, something that they did, like in their past, that they, they couldn't possibly be saved, it was impossible for them to be saved. That's a lie. That's a lie. The blood isn't selective. When you confess and repent, it doesn't say that he'll, he's faithful and just to forgive us from some sins. No, it says he forgives us from, for our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, okay? So deception becomes the root of all defeat and the devil is the father of all deception. So spiritual warfare is the fight to believe God's truth. His word is truth. Get with the Holy Spirit. Get the truth in our hearts. <clears throat> and the truth begins to override the lies of the enemy, just begin to tell them that's a lie, devil. And I refuse to believe it. Okay? So in order for you to know it's a lie, you have to get in the book, see? And begin to hide the word in your heart. What we believe can give power <clears throat> to or take power from the devil and the sin nature. What we believe about ourselves, what we believe about the world around us, what we believe about our relationship with God, it either gives power to the enemy <clears throat> or it takes power away from the enemy, okay? It will either empower or um, disenfranchise the sin nature. So we want to deactivate those, those, those fortresses we want to set them up for destruction when they are built on a lie. That's why years ago, the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to take my word 
<clears throat> and I want you to wallpaper the walls of your heart, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, every nook and cranny of your heart. I want you to wallpaper it with my word so that if ever anything tries to come in that does not align with my word that you have hidden in your heart, you will know immediately that it's not me and you will do what? Cast down that imagination. You will pull down that stronghold. You will destroy that stronghold, okay? So that's what we need to do. So John, let's look for instance at John 8, John chapter 8 and verse number 36, John 8. Uh, let's see. And verse number 36. Look at this. It says, so if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Okay. So we need to believe that if we are in Christ and the son has set us free, then we are free indeed. And so you need to use that truth to cast down the imagination that tells you, you will always be in bondage to this. You will always be in bondage to that. You will always have this habit or you will always have this addiction. The devil is a lie. The word says what? Look at it again. John 8 and 36. So if the son makes you free, you are free indeed. Okay. And so that is the truth. <clears throat> a lie is a contradiction of the truth. A lie is a contradiction of the truth, but deception occurs when we believe the lie. See, the enemy can come with, at you with a lie. And initially your reaction is like, oh, that, that's not true. But if you keep hearing it, you begin to believe it. So then that lie becomes deception when you believe it. And that deception is the foundation for the stronghold. Uh, that, was, that was worth you tuning in. Lie, a lie becomes deception. Okay? And once it is deception, it becomes a thought and feeling pattern in your life that becomes actions that you live by, that become habits, that become cycles of living or bondage. You know, and those lies can be spoken from uh, people in our family. Siblings can say all types of things to us. Um, uh, parents can say things to children. Any Anybody that's in authority really has a tremendous impact. And if what they're saying is not true, that lie, if we don't deal with the lie, if we don't say, that's a lie and we embrace it, then it becomes deception. When we believe the lie, you know, don't nobody want you, you know, don't nobody, don't nobody love you, that kind of thing. And then we, we begin to believe the deception. Oh, I'm unlovable. Or somebody tells you you're, you're ugly, you're unattractive, you know, uh, we, man, I could really hang out there for a minute because see, I was born in 1960. So I was born during the, just at the beginning when, you know, the, the African-American community was just starting. I think it was it um, James Brown, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Remember that song back in the, I think that was the 60s. If it wasn't the 60s, it was the early 70s. But prior to that, what no say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. People use that, even within the African-American community, depending on, which goes back to the institution of slavery, depending on the complexion of your skin, your skin color, the darker you were, the more unattractive you were told that you were. And if you had kinky hair, you know, we had this thing about nappy hair and good hair. See, all of those things were lies that became um, deception once we believed it and it affected how we saw not only ourselves but how we looked at other black people how what what we saw and it took like a cultural revolution to unseat some of that you know and to to get to the place where we were able to embrace 
you know, who we are. Listen, what what time is it? Oh, I don't even have time to unpack that. But there are things that even you, that you, the listener, those of you who are studying with me, things that somebody spoke over your life. It could be an ex whoever, things that people said to you or about you, children in school, teachers, coaches, something you heard on TV or whatever. And that lie, that lie, if initially there's kind of like a hesitancy, like, oh, that couldn't be true. But the more you hear it, it there's a, you develop a file, it, you, you give place to it. It, 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 a foundation is laid and it, the deception then becomes a stronghold the more you feed it, okay? And so the lie becomes deception, which becomes a thought or a feeling pattern, which becomes an action that you begin to live out of. It produces habits in our lives, addictions, cycles of living and bondage. So no matter the symptom, no matter what it is that you are wrestling with, it doesn't matter what the what the the lie is that you've been carrying around for decades. I depend on how old you are. The source is a stronghold of deception, a lie that the enemy was able to <clears throat> um, pierce um, your soul and get it in. But I'm telling you that the solution, your freedom, your freedom is the truth. When you begin to release the word of God to that thing, the truth of the word of God, it will demolish the stronghold and set you free. Listen, remember John 14 and verse 16 says, I will ask the father and he will give you another helper that may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So you want to embrace the spirit of truth. Matter of fact, this week, <clears throat> ask the Holy Spirit to shine the light of his truth on every lie that has been that has um, produced a stronghold in your life. Ask him to show you the lies and show you the truth so that you can beat the lie down where you can demolish it with the truth. John 8, 28, you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Holy Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. That And the truth, which is the Holy Spirit, breaks the bondage. The Holy Spirit is truth. The word is truth. And this will break the bondage. So... We're out of time, but listen, that's your homework for this week. I want you to get with the Lord and just begin to ask him, Lord, show me any strongholds of lies in my, show me the strongholds, show me how I have been believing a lie and then show me the truth concerning the word of God. And then you can apply, you confess it, you repent, you renounce it. Write that down, confess, repent, renounce the lie, and then you break it with the power of the Holy Spirit. You cancel its lease and you invite the Holy Spirit in. We're out of time. We're never out of words, but we're out of time. You've been watching the Living Water Livestream Bible Study. My name is Bernadine Wormley Daniels, Soterios Ministries Incorporated, and it is my esteemed privilege to share the word of God with you on tonight. I pray that it has been a blessing to you. Um, I'm going to put some information in the comment session, um, section where if you want to sow into Soteria's Ministries, we need your support. You are more than welcome to do so. We are a 501c3, which will give you a tax receipt at the end of the year or beginning of the tax season next year. So take care, beloved. Listen, God loves you. He really does. And so do I.